Welcome to Sanseat Philosophia's Distinguished Lecture Series. This morning, it is indeed an honor to have Dr. John C. Sanford address the NIH community. Dr. Sanford is a retired professor at Cornell University. He received his MS and PhD from the University of Wisconsin in the field of plant genetics. As a Cornell University professor, he conducted genetic research for over 40 years, resulting in more than 100 scientific publications and several dozen patents. He, re he, presently pre uh, pre he is presently president of Feed My Sheep Foundation, which focuses on supporting science and technology research initiatives in the area of life sciences. Dr. Sanford's most significant scientific contributions have been the biolistic process, colloquially known as the gene gun, of which a prototype is now part of the collection of the Smithsonian National Museum of American History, and of which principles have enabled agriculture to grow crops and feed billions in the third world. He is co-inventor of the pathogen-derived resistance process and co-inventor of the genetic vaccination process. He is the formulator and author of the treaties Genetic Entropy and the developer of Mendel's Accountant, a comprehensive numerical simulation of the mutation selection process. Dr. Sanford was the lead organizer editor of the Cornell Symposium and its subsequently published proceedings entitled Biological Information, New Perspectives. And most recently, he is co-author of Contested Bones, a review of paleoanthropology and its current status. Let us welcome Dr. Sanford this morning as he presents an address entitled Net Genetic Loss in Humans in Bacteria and in Virus. Dr. Sanford, would you please accept the podium? So I'd like to thank uh, Peter Leeds and the Science and Philosophy Group for inviting me. And I'd like to just uh, say that NIH I hold in the highest possible esteem. And so it's a great privilege for me to share with you uh, my research from, uh, that I've been doing for about the last two decades. And that research represents the second half of my career. The first half of my career involved crop improvement and genetic engineering technologies. Uh, and for the last 18 years, I've been studying what I would call genetic theory. And so I've shortened my title. I, I was a little too ambitious in what I wanted to cover uh, in a single talk. And so the title is Human Genetic Degeneration? Question mark. It's not really a question mark because most of the people in the field of population genetics know that the human race is now uh, has a growing genetic load because of the accumulation of deleterious mutations. And so, but we need to understand that. And so I, I'd like to share information for you that's relevant to this very important topic. I'd like to distinguish the main concern and the secondary concern. I originally got involved in this research because I was interested in the question, what can mutation plus selection do and what can it do? And so that involved evolutionary theory and problems with evolutionary theory. But as I've gotten deeper into the topic, more and more I've realized genetic degeneration is a very serious concern for the human race. Mutations are catastrophic. And so um, I'd like to put the, addressing the, the concern of human genetic degeneration and what we might do to slow it down uh, as the primary concern. So, Human mutation is catastrophic, and so arguably it's one of the primary causes of death and suffering. So we know that nearly all non-neutral mutations are deleterious, and we inherit a multitude of mutations from our ancestors and our parents, and then from the very first division of our zygote, we begin to add new mutations to that genetic load. And so we accumulate mutations at the rate of approximately three new mutations every cell division throughout our lifetime. And so that growing genetic load is what causes aging and limits the upper life limit of our race. We die due to, primarily due to mutation accumulation. And tragically, that's not the end of it because we pass on the mutations we inherited, and the new mutations that we've generated to our children. And so the children should be more mutant than their parents consistently, which is why genetic load tends to accumulate continuously over time. 
So just to put that in perspective, it's now widely understood that the human mutation rate is approximately 100 mutations per person per generation. And so our children have about 100 more mutations than we have, and our grandchildren will have about 100 more mutations than they have. So that's very disturbing. It's even more disturbing on the population level. If there are 100 mutations per person and there's 7 billion people on the planet, then there are 700 billion new mutations entering the human population in this generation. And so the question becomes, what type of selection could eliminate so many mutations that are pouring into the human population? So my colleagues and I have been studying this for 18 years. It's resulted in about 20 scientific papers and three books. And so I can't summarize all that in this short talk, but um, if you go to fmsfound.org, to that site, there's clickable links to all of, of the relevant papers that I've written uh, on this topic. Just before uh, we continue, I'd just like to clarify a little bit of vocabulary. Some people are saying that I'm misusing the word entropy, and I'd just like to clarify that because I believe I'm using the word appropriately. So the term entropy is used by physicists in a very specific sense, and in a somewhat different sense, engineers use that term, and people who are involved in information theory also use that term, and it's not quite the same. Um, very similar mathematical formulation, but different concepts. And so people say, well, you have to use that terminology. But actually, I'm using entropy in the generic sense or in the common sense of the word, and I'm using it correctly. So for example, uh, in, in the Merriam-Webster dictionary, it says broadly the degree of disorder or uncertainty in a system. They also say it can mean degradation of matter and energy in the universe to an ultimate state of inert uniformity or the general trend of the universe toward death and disorder or a process of degradation or running down or a trend of disorder. Normally, the, for, the, the tech, most technical definition of entropy is it's a measure of disorder, but more broadly used, it's a process where disorder always increases. So other dictionaries uh, have similar definitions. The tendency of a system that is left to itself to descend into chaos. Entropy increases as matter and energy in the universe degrade. And the second law of thermodynamics states the entropy must increase in all processes. So that's the sense I'm using the term. So if I talk about genetic entropy or if I talk about entropic decay of the genome, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, so. On what basis should we be concerned about genetic degeneration? There are four fundamental problems that we should be concerned about, and these problems are not widely understood. The first one is there are limits to what advantageous mutations can do. And so advantageous mutations might counteract the effect of the flood of deleterious mutations that are entering the human population. But what we'll see is that actually beneficial mutations are rare and seldom can make the type of compensation that's needed to stop the net loss of information. Secondly, natural selection is severely constrained by something I call selection interference. And it's because selecting for one trait interferes with selecting for another trait. And when you have billions of traits segregating in the population, then the selection process starts to work against itself and you are, end up only being able to select the best or worst mutations. The third problem is that the deleterious mutations are pouring into our population much faster than they can be selectively removed. And then lastly, most mutations are not neutral, although that's the, the common conception, most mutations are nearly neutral, and that totally changes uh, the implication. Okay, so let's start by talking about the limits of beneficial mutations. So Darwin uh, believed that fitness would increase continuously through natural selection, but he didn't know what natural selection was acting on. He didn't know about genetics or Mendel or mutations. And so his book really is largely philosophical and conceptual. 
it's not really subject to testing because really there was no way to know what was being transmitted. But with the coming of Ronald Fisher, decades later, Fisher brought mathematical rigor to the understanding of selection. And he uh, is really the father of population genetics. Haldane and Wright also contributed, but he was really the one who got it started. And it started with his book, Genetical Theory of Natural Selection. And his thesis, he proves in his book that uh, what he calls the fundamental theorem of natural selection. And the essence of what he proved claimed that fitness would always increase universally and automatically. Most biologists know that's not true, but it's been held up as a mathematical proof that, uh, that things are going better, not worse, and that, and that that's uh, like a mathematical certainty. He stated it very strongly. He said, this is like a natural law. And actually, the law he likened it to was entropy, or the second law of thermodynamics. This famous person and his famous theorem, probably the most famous theorem in biology, was accepted uncritically for about 90 years. And so last year, a mathematician and I critically assessed his formulation and found that there had major problems with it. It wasn't complete, and it had some, one, one of the most foundational premises for his mathematics was the assumption that mutations had a net neutral effect. And so we now know that's clearly wrong, so it requires a reformulation of his theorem. We have to include mutations in the equation, and that's what we published uh, on in mathematical biology last year. So here's how he envisioned. Uh, he envisioned mutations to be arising with their mutational effect ranging from very bad to very good, with neutrals being centered. So that he pictured a, a, a balance of good and bad mutations so that he could just ignore the impact of mutations because they were, had a net neutral effect. The problem is we now know beyond any doubt that beneficial mutations are very rare and that um, non-neutral mutations are consistently deleterious as you'd expect from typographical changes in a text. So here's a very strong quote, which I think is right on, by Kitely and Lynch. They say, the vast majority of mutations are deleterious, and this is one of the most well-established principles of evolutionary genetics, supported by both molecular and quantitative genetic data. And so that's a very strong statement. It's the most, one of the most well-established principles. And uh, I, I show two other papers that have similar conclusions. The first one has a subtitle, Wither Beneficial Mutations. And in that paper, the author argues that beneficials are so rare, we can't measure how rare they are. Garish and Linsky actually look at biological data. They have the long-term evolutionary experiment uh, with bacteria. And they actually monitored the sequence changes over time in bacterial populations and found that the beneficial mutations were indeed exceedingly rare. They estimated one in a million mutations is beneficial. So that just puts it in perspective. So Fisher's formula, I, this, I'm, not gonna, I'm not a mathematician, uh, and I'm not going to talk much about math, but basically Fisher's formula was very simple. He said that the increase in fitness over time was due to only one thing, and that was the amount of genetic variability in the population. And so he doesn't have a factor of mutations because, as we said, he looked at mutations cancel each other out, and so the mutational effects don't matter. So since we know that's wrong, Basner's formula, my, my collaborator's formula, uh, says that fitness over change depends upon the pre-existing variation in the population plus the effect of mutations, which are, and the net effect of the mutations is always very skewed toward a deleterious effect. So basically, variation in the population allows you to do selection. That tends to increase fitness. The mutations that pour into the population are overwhelmingly deleterious. They tend to decrease fitness. So fitness gain is not at all certain. In fact, when we actually plug in realistic biological parameters, increasing fitness is very, very problematic. 
And so basically our research has flipped his theorem. The Fisher's theorem has gone from proving that fitness is always increasing to uh, indicating that fitness is actually, it's very difficult. You need very extraordinary parameter settings to actually get a net gain in fitness. So I organized a symposium at Cornell a while back on the topic of biological information, new perspectives, and the proceedings are available. I have a synopsis for people who are interested. You don't want to read the whole proceedings, but the synopsis is useful. So see me afterwards if that, if that interests you. But that symposium addressed the question, what is biological information? Secondly, where does it come from? How does it arise? And thirdly, can it be sustained? Or is biological information inherently subject to entropic decay? And so one of the things we found and published in that proceedings was that most beneficial mutations are too subtle to be selected. They're invisible to natural selection. And so I just, I'm going to take a few seconds to, ex to just explain this, this figure from the paper. These are fitness effects, and so total neutrality would be here. So here are, would be uh, neutrals. Over here would be extremely beneficial things, things that would increase. Here would be where a single mutation can increase fitness by 10%. And so you have a continuum of fitness effects. One means that that a, a given fitness effect is accumulating just as if there's no selection. And what we see is that the vast majority of beneficial mutations don't get selected until we get into the really high impact beneficials. And uh, this is a, um, visually a little bit deceptive because this is a log scale. So the vast majority of mutations are too subtle to be selected and only the best mutations get amplified. So not only is our beneficials very rare, but they are uh, overwhelmingly nearly neutral, unselectable. I'm going to take a minute to explain this because it's critical to understanding the, the, the issues that we're dealing with. Um, if this is a distribution of fitness effects with zero being neutral mutations, okay, what we have is three things to observe. First of all, the mutations under this curve are vastly more abundant than the rare mutations that are to the right of zero. Number two, the curves are very steeply uh, crowded towards zero, so that most mutations are nearly neutral, and the exact shape of the curve doesn't change what happens. Just any curve like this that are where you have mostly have low impact alleles means that there's a problem. The third point is that there is a no selection zone where natural selection can't see those mutational effects. And so there's a, a, a significant zone, exactly how wide it is, depends upon numerous variables. But there is a no selection zone. So in this area, basically mutations accumulate as if there's no selection. There are things over here that can be selected away, but those are, that depends on numerous variables. And there are very rare beneficials where you can get a really significant impact. And these can actually increase net fitness but they are very isolated, and so there's a limit to what they can do. So we've done thousands of numerical simulations with different parameters. What we see is that using realistic parameters, we always see net loss of information, net loss of fitness. Um, but we can get, if we have enough beneficials, and if there are enough high impact beneficials, we can create a, a situation where our numerical scores within a simulation um, due to just a few extremely beneficial mutations can more than compensate for large numbers of low impact deleterious mutations. And you can go, okay, well that's interesting, is, but that's just a few good mutations trying to balance out thousands of bad mutations. Is there a problem with that? The problem is this leads to increasing fitness only in a narrow or artificial sense. In a broader sense, the whole genome is still de degenerating because while a few nucleotide sites are being improved, huge numbers are being degraded. This type of trade-off is not sustainable as it results in a shrinking functional genome. Basically, you're throwing out lots of information from lots of nucleotide sites, and you're trying to replace all that information with a single desirable point mutation.
So that's, um, that's something that we've been researching in depth. Realistically, there are a few extremely beneficial mutations. Mostly they're reductive. For example, sickle cell anemia is an example of a beneficial mutation. It has a very significant impact, but it's actually reductive. That is, it's a broken gene, broken protein, broken cell, and it's, in the long run, not taking things forward. It's actually degrading. So one more point I'd like to make in terms of beneficial mutations is that when you're trying to uh, increase information or compensate for loss of information, usually single point mutations acting uh, here, there, and everywhere in the genome don't add up to the type of information that's being degraded. A single point mutation can kill a gene, but it's really hard to improve a gene unless you can change strings of nucleotides. It's a little bit like this. Random letters in the alphabet don't have information, but if you put them into words, you can start to build information. So we need words, really, to enhance or compensate uh, a genome. So my colleagues and I have published a paper a few years ago, uh, the waiting time problem in a model hominin population. So taking into consideration a pre-human population with a population size of about 10,000, how long does it take to take two nucleotides in that genome and switch them to two other nucleotides at the same location. That's, that, that's the waiting time. Does it might be, what, you think thousands, maybe millions of years to wait for that? Well, um, it takes a lot longer than that. So it turns out that um, here we have a, a, a graph where this is the string length. A string of two would be a dinucleotide where you're going to change two letters, three up to eight. So really small genetic words, so to speak. And on this scale, we have time. And you'll notice it's being measured in billions of years. Well, what's with that? So um, let's just go walk through this and we'll try to understand why the waiting time is so long. Uh, first of all, if you're just waiting for a single mutation, for a single nucleotide change, and you're waiting for that change to actually catch hold in the population and be selected to fixation, it's surprisingly long just to make a single specific nucleotide change, about 1.5 million years. So the ape to man timeline is about 6 million years. So this is only changing one letter. So if you're waiting for a string of two, it takes 84 million years. If you're waiting for a string of three, which would be, let's say, as create a new codon, change an amino acid, um, 376 million years, and it goes up from there. For a string of eight, it takes, which would be a short genetic word, you need more time than the universe has had. This sounds crazy, right? This paper is rock solid and has been read by 10,000 people, and there's been no serious critique. So it's, it's it, I'd be happy to, if you read the paper, and you'll see it's really solid. So there's a huge waiting time in terms of even creating small amounts of information uh, that's more than simple letter changes, single letter changes. So the conclusion for beneficial mutations is, for many reasons, rare beneficial mutations cannot sufficiently compensate for the relentless influx of deleterious mutations. That's the bottom line. And there's, it's just really strong. Second. Um, so, Selection is limited by selection interference. Haldane's dilemma. Haldane's dilemma is a famous problem that was recognized by Haldane, who was the second most important founder of neo-Darwinian theory. So first Fisher gave us neo-Darwinian theory, and then Haldane expanded upon it. But well into his career, he realized there was a major problem and so let me just read to you about it. He, he said his paper in 57 titled The Cost of Natural Selection. How much does it cost to select away the unfit? That's the question. There's a co the cost of selection is individuals in a population have to prematurely die. And so you can only do selection to the extent you have a surplus population. And once you've used up that surplus population selecting for certain things, you can't select anymore. 
So if you're selecting for, trying to select for too many things at once, you have to eliminate too many individuals in the population. The population will start to shrink and will go to extinction. So here's the way he describes it. Natural selection cannot occur with great intensity for a number of characters at once. He says if two species differ at a thousand different locations, or if you have basically a, to get a, a thousand mutations substituted, the mean rate of generation substitution uh, as has been suggested, is one per 300 generations. It takes at least 300,000 generations, which is six million years, to get a thousand mutations fixed, a thousand beneficials fixed. Um, he says, even the geological time scale is too short for such processes to go on in respect to thousands of loci. I am convinced that the quantitative arguments in this kind put forward here should play a part in all future discussions of evolution. That's how profound he thought this problem was. It should be the center of discussion. And the issue is how much selection can you do effectively because selection involves elimination of individuals. Haldane's dilemma was um, actually the reason that Kimura developed the neutral theory of evolution. So Kimura realized Haldane was right. He said, Haldane's well-known estimate, a new allele may be substituted in a population every 300 generations, and at the rate of one substitution of every two years, he says, the substitutional load becomes so large. Substitutional load means how many individuals have to be selected away within a population. That's the cost. Uh, the substitutional load becomes so large that the mammalian species could not tolerate it. He ends up by saying, compared to Haldane, the form, uh, for Haldane's formula of the cost is larger. He's saying Haldane underestimated the problem. And then he gives an example of how much, you know, to see the amount of polymorphisms we see in the human population. We would need each parent to have three million offspring. So you can select away all but two. That's the, that's the problem. And so he said that doesn't work mathematically. There is no species that makes, certainly not people, where you can have an average of three million progeny per female. And so he said, most of the genetic change, most of the polymorphisms we see in the human genome must be due to neutral mutations. Therefore, most of the genome must be junk. But it's based upon this idea of the cost of substitution. Mueller expanded upon this. So Mueller is the only population genetist to get a Nobel Prize. He got a Nobel Prize for showing that radiation increases mutation rates. And he was very concerned with human genetic degeneration. And so one of the things he realized as he considering the problem of human degeneration is that uh, if you have linkage groups, you know, the human genome is made up of linkage groups. And so there's, if a typical linkage group is 30,000 letters long. So mutations in that linkage group are linked forever, basically. And so if you have lots of bad mutations entering that linkage group, and basically the linkage group is reducing in fitness continuously, if you throw in one or two beneficials, they just get neutralized by the large number of deleterious. So linkage is a killer. It means every linkage block needs to degenerate. And so he originally formulated it, this is a problem for asexual species because you can't break apart the good and the bad genes. So you can't get selection to work. Um, but it doesn't just apply to asexual species, it applies to every linkage block in the human genome. That problem is Mueller's ratchet because the ratchet is that a linkage group can only get worse, it can never get better, okay? So Lowe is a scientist who took that an issue and analyzed it in terms of just human mitochondrial DNA. So an infinitesimally small part of the human genome. And he, he concluded that a surprisingly large range of biologically realistic parameter combinations should have led to the extinction of the evolutionary line leading to humans within 20 million years. Well, 20 million years is a long, you know, we're not, most of us, are too worried about how much we're going to degenerate in the next 20 million years. But the problem is that he's only looking at a tiny, tiny, fraction of the genome. So if you consider all the linkage blocks in the genome, not just this one, the problem is becomes very significant in the, even in the near term. The bottom line of this issue is that the near neutral box gets bigger, meaning the part of the genome that's unselectable gets broader, 
uh, depending upon different types of noise, like environmental noise and other issues. But the biggest interfering factor for selection is the other mutations. If you have too many mutations, uh, good and bad, everything cancels out and you uh, have a huge no selection zone. Conclusion in terms of this problem is that uh, as mutations accumulate, selection interference gets worse and worse. And so selection efficiency progressively breaks down such that only the best and the worst mutations are selectable. Thirdly is the issue of the flood of deleterious mutations pouring in to the human population. So if mutation rate is too high, natural selection cannot remove the mutations as fast as they arise. So again, coming back to Mueller, the Nobel laureate. So he, in 1950, wrote the paper, Our Load of Mutations. And here's what he says. It's, it's, it's surprising what he says. Uh, actually, his whole paper is surprising. But here's what he says about the, the, the critical mutation rate. He was very, very concerned that we were near the tipping point in where mutations, if the mutation rate goes too high, human race must degenerate, and if it continues, all the way to extinction. So he was extremely concerned about this. A major concern at that time was uh, nations were using nuclear testing in, open, in the open air. So there was radiation floating throughout the atmosphere of the world. And he's saying, we may be destroying the human race in the long run by doing that. So he wanted to know the tipping point. He says the upper mutation rate, that beyond which equilibrium is impossible, must be much lower than 0.5. That means half a mutation per person, per generation, is too high. And he goes on to say it might even be as low as 0.1, one mutation in 10 individuals every generation. Even, he says, if selection were to be given full scope. So he was a eugenicist. He would have said, let the unfits um, perish. Don't let them reproduce. But he's, he's assuming intense selection. By the way, our numerical simulations, we always assume our default parameter setting is half of the population is removed every generation. So we're doing very intense selection in our numerical simulations, much more than Mueller would have said would be reasonable. So let's look at the numbers behind Mueller's estimates. So a lot of population genetics have looked at this issue, and uh, they've come up with an equation Nachman and Crowell published the equation, but apparently Kimura was already doing, making similar calculations, and it's apparent that Mueller was doing similar calculations. But so here's a formula that tells us how much of a population must be selective eliminated depending on U, E is a constant, U is the number of deleterious mutations per person per generation. So it, you, it can tell us how much elimination is needed or a slightly different formulation. It tells us how many offspring per female are required to stay ahead of the bad mutations. So you can select away the bad mutations as they accumulate. Uh, for a mutation rate of 0.1, which was Mueller's estimate, uh, that requires 10% selective elimination. Now, when I say 10% selective elimination, I'm not talking about normal juvenile deaths like due to car accidents or wars or pestilence. I'm talking about where people are dying because they are distinctly inferior to the people around them. So selective elimination doesn't include all that accidental death. It has to do with uh, fitness-based death. So this is actually a very, this is kind of an upper limit. A lot of geneticists would say, yeah, 10% of the population being selected away is a realistic number. So that's manageable. But if the mutation rate goes to one, it actually becomes problematic. You have to get rid of 63% of the population. And that means minimally, even after the accidental deaths, 5.4 offspring per female so that two soon can survive. Mutation rate of two, it goes up to 14 children per female. And for a mutation rate of three, you need 40 offspring per female, not including the accidental deaths. So this is the Nachman and Crowell paper. Basically, they, they were measuring 175 new mutations per generation. Uh, they're, they're off a little bit, but it doesn't matter. The genetic load associated with such a high U would be intolerable. They go on to say, for U equals three, deleterious mutation rate of three per person per generation, each fail would need to produce 40 offspring, as our calculations show. And this assumes all mortalities due to selection. So basically, there's a series of papers that say that, 
Here's one that says it is difficult to explain how human populations could have survived a high rate of deleterious mutation where it's, they consider a high rate of mutation anything over one uh, is a paradoxical to a species with a low reproductive rate. And they go on to say deleterious mutation rates appear to be so high in humans and our close relatives, it's doubtful that such species could survive. So the interesting thing is they're assuming that the actual mutation rate is down around one or two mutations per generation. All of the people I'm going to describe assume that 90 to 99 percent of the genome is junk DNA. And so that's now very much in doubt. It's widely recognized that there's more than three mutations per person per generation that are deleterious. So here's another author. The implications of mutations of this magnitude for population genetics and evolutionary theory are profound. The question of how our species accommodate such mutation rates is central to evolutionary thought. So they're saying this is a big deal. This isn't some side issue. Uh, how just looking at the mitochondrial DNA, just looking at an infinitesimally tiny part of the genome, they say, we should increase our attention to the broader question of how or whether organisms can tolerate, in the sense of evolution, a genetic system with such a high mutation burden. He's just talking about mitochondria mutations. Here's a, a most recent publication on this issue, a book written by Alex Kondrashoff, who was here for, at NIH for a long time, now is teaching at Michigan. Uh, he just wrote a book called Crumbling Genome. And he, here's a, a few interesting things coming from his book. Number one, he says, in the average human genotype, over 100 genes are dysfunctional or missing. And he adds, uh, and over 1,000 genes are substantially impaired. Doesn't that make you feel healthy and vigorous, knowing that you have carried that much genetic load? It's very, very concerning. He goes on to say, a newborn human carries about 100 new de novo mutations originated in the germline. And he says about 10% of those are substantially deleterious. That's a huge thing to say. To say that 10% of the genome is functional means that you need 10 mutations per person per generation, which goes way over the top in terms of what a population can sustain. So we used this, this, this formula earlier. Uh, and basically, with 10 mutations per person per generation, you need 44,000 offspring per female. That's not exactly reasonable. Now, Dan Grower has, uh, has chided ENCODE, the ENCODE project at NIH, for considering that perhaps a large fraction of the genome might be functional, let's say even 80%, in which case there would be 80 new mutations per person per generation. And he correctly realizes that you need something like 10 to the 35th power offspring per female. And he calls that bonkers. And I say that Dr. Grower is totally right. That is bonkers. But 10 to the 11th is bonkers. And 44,000 children per female is bonkers. So all these assumptions assume that their genetic degeneration is not happening. And it's clear that all those calculations are bonkers. Mutations are happening at somewhere between 10 and 80% or some significant part of the genome is functional. And that's why people are upset about ENCODE, is because if there are a significant part of the genome that's, that's functional, then we are experiencing rapid genetic degeneration. And so there are many lines of evidence that show this. All these paradoxes go away if we simply accept that the genome is degenerating, which is painfully obvious. Okay, so. Do people argue against this? They do, but it's kind of like straw men that they're, they're dealing with. Of course, the, the idea that it's, if, it's, if it's almost all junk, then the mutation rate isn't nearly so high. If, if we could get mutation down to one or two or three mutations, well, three is over the top, isn't it? So you need to get down to one or two percent of the genome is functional, or genetic degeneration is certain. Some people have formulated a kind of far-fetched and hypothesis called the mutation, I call it the mutation count mechanism, uh, where they say, well, as mutations accumulate, um, Mother Nature somehow counts the number of mutations per person, and then selection is against the people who have high mutation. The people who have accumulated more mutations are selected away. Um, we've done simulations of that, and we have basically have disproven it. You can look it up as under the 
link I gave you. You can read that paper. But it's really clear that that hypothesis is not real, biologically realistic, doesn't work. The second explanation is the, something called synergistic epistasis mechanism. Um, and again, we've proven that it doesn't work. The idea is if you have lots of mutations that are deleterious, as they accumulate, they amplify each other's deleterious effect. The intensity of degeneration is so great that somehow it improves selection. It's just the opposite of the way it works. Um, and that somehow that, that helps. All of our simulations show that if we introduce synergistic epistasis, it goes to, degenerates much faster, which is what logic would demand, and populations go extinct quickly. All three of these really have been falsified. So conclusion in terms of the large number of mutations pouring into the population, even if we could solve the other three problems that I described, a deleterious mutation rate of three or more ensures continuous genetic degeneration. The proposed escape mechanisms are not credible. They've been falsified. So number four, the near neutral problem. The near neutral problem is a longer term concern, but this is the most significant problem. And so I want to explain it to you. The near neutral problem was first recognized by, again, Mueller, who has had such a huge impact. And in his Mueller's ratchet paper, he didn't use that term, that was coined later, but in his paper about this inter selection interference and the accumulation of more bad mutations in linkage groups than good mutations, uh, he says there comes a level of advantage, however, that is too small to be effectively seized upon by selection its voice being lost in the noise, so to speak. Well, whether you're talking about beneficials or deleterious, the idea is most, think of it this way. You have a genome of three billion letters, okay? And you take out one letter or you change one letter randomly. Okay, is that gonna have a huge fitness effect? It's gonna have a tiny fitness effect. And in fact, it's real, it's like, it's like rust on a car. You can't see each rust event, but it is continuous and destructive. So. The person who studied this most was Dr. Tomoko Ota, and she is one of the few female population geneticists. She was mentored by Dr. Kimura, the author of The Neutral Theory of Evolution. And he was saying, most of the genome is junk, and it's just, um, and so it doesn't have any deleterious effect, mutations in those parts of the genome. She said, no, most mutations are nearly neutral. They're, they're, they're low enough impact, they can't be influenced by selection, but they're still a problem because they accumulate. And so she actually persuaded her mentor and eventually Kimura accepted, yeah, they're mostly nearly neutral, not neutral. This is huge because you're all taught that most of the genome is junk and that it's mostly neutral, but it's not. So here's a recent paper that, uh, that clarifies this. Walker and Kitely, they're talking about the distribution of fitness effects of new mutations. And they say it seems unlikely that any mutation is truly neutral in the sense that it has no effect on fitness. All mutations must have some effect, even if that effect is vanishingly small. So that statement, which is, which is correct, is a game changer for how we understand uh, what's happening in the genome. So here is Dr. Crow, one of the most distinguished geneticists of the last century, and uh, he's writing at PNAS, and he's talking about the mutation rate and is it a health risk. And he says the typical mutation is very mild. It usually has no overt effect, but shows up as a small decrease in viability or fertility. He goes on to say, for the past few centuries, harmful mutations have been accumulating. The decrease in viability from mutation accumulation is something like one to two percent per generation. He's saying the human race is degenerating and has been degenerating for a long time at the rate of one percent per generation. That's pretty astounding. Um, and so uh, it doesn't sound too bad in one generation, but if you start with a fitness of one and just have it reduced by 1% for 300 generations, uh, you see a radical decline in fitness. And that we see that in our simulations and we see that in, uh, in, in biological systems as well. When this very distinguished geneticist said we have a problem and that we're degenerating, anyone who cares about long-term human health and welfare should take note. Okay, so Kondrashoff, who used to work here, uh, he wrote a paper and the subtitle is, why aren't we dead a hundred times over? Okay, 
And so he says, I interpret the results in terms of the whole genome and show in agreement with Tachita that VSDMs, very slight deleterious mutations, can cause too high a mutational load. Accumulation of VSDMs in a lineage acts like a time bomb. The existence of vertebrate lineages should be limited to like a million generations. Okay, so he's saying this is a huge long-term problem. But you have to understand he believes that the mutation rate is like one or two mutations. Well, this was earlier, he published this earlier, when he was thinking the mutation rate was much lower than it really is. So it's worse than he says, but it is a long-term issue. So Michael Lynch is one of the people who's most, uh, who studied this in the greatest depth. And so I'd just like to quote a few of his papers. Uh, here is a paper early on that he wrote. Uh, we find that the accumulation of new Mildly deleterious mutations fundamentally alters the scaling of extinction time, causing the extinction of populations that would be deemed safe on the basis of demography alone. In his 2010 paper, a more recent paper in PNAS, uh, he says he predicts that in the next few centuries we will see one to five percent fitness decline per generation. So he's actually more pessimistic than Crow. And so that's a five percent would be disastrous. And uh, he concludes, we will see significant incapacitation at the morphological, physiological, and neurobiological levels. So he's very concerned. He's, um, and again, 2016, he published most recently, in the United States, the incidence of the variety of afflictions, including autism, male infertility, asthma, immune system disorders, diabetes, already exhibit increases exceeding the expected rate. And he goes on to say, the long-term consequence of such effects is an expected genetic degeneration in the baseline human condition. So our own research confirms and further elucidates the things I've been studying. So this is one of the papers that we published, Can Purifying Natural Selection Preserve Biological Information from the same symposium? And uh, I just want to show you three very illuminating plots that Mendel's accountant, our, our numerical simulation, consistently reveal. The first one is mutation accumulation. So we have uh, 5,000 generations here, and we have uh, the mutation count per person over time. And if you have a, a mutation rate of 50, which is kind of halfway between 100 and none, 50% functionality in the human genome is not unreasonable in my point of view. Uh, Notice that it goes up like clockwork. The upward increase is always a straight line. In other words, it's very systematic. The accumulation is incredibly systematic. And so basically, this, the way this is structured is that if there was no selection, and we had 50 mutations per person per generation, uh, this line would be straight, but it would end up right here. So during 5,000 generations, we, we eliminated less than 10% of the bad mutations. The rest of the mutations are accumulating as if there's no selection. That's a huge problem. By the way, there are beneficial mutations in that, but they don't show up because they're so far down. The, the, it, they're basically bouncing along right along the bottom of the line there. So beneficials happen, but there's no way they can counterbalance the deleterious. This is the deleterious mutation plot with a log scale. We're plotting how much of the mutations at these different levels of fitness effect accumulate. So the mutations over here are accumulating just as if there's no selection going on. Over here, we have perfect elimination. The high impact deleterious mutations are selected away very effectively. We have using codominance with this. Uh, but the low impact mutations, to escal they, it's like rust on the car, they just continuously accumulate. There's a transition zone where things are accumulating but not as fast. At this point, right in the middle, where at 0.5 is what we call the thre selection threshold. Okay? So there is a selection threshold. The size of the near neutral box is large. And so the lastly, if we look at the beneficials, again, we see that in using the same, the same experiment is that beneficials are pretty much not amplified until we get into the high impact. And they're there, but they, they don't even show up in our plots, in our uh, mutation count plots. So we do end up seeing a crow type decline. In a 5,000 generation period, we see a radical decline in fitness. So that's the near neutral problem is
a long-term process, but it's really interesting to know that, you know, I don't think that this near-neutral problem is stoppable. It's unstoppable, basically. So it has implications. So in conclusion, even if the deleterious mutation rates were less than one, the near-neutral problem should very gradually cause the human genome to rust out and degenerate. So final conclusions. Our research over the last almost two decades has validated and elucidated, further elucidated, all of the problems that were already well known within the field of population genetics. Just to review the four points in summary, beneficiaries cannot keep up with deleterious mutations. Selection interference profoundly limits selection efficiency. High mutation rates, anything above two, should cause rapid gene degeneration, and near neutrals should be virtually unstoppable. That's the summation of the last 18 years of my research, and it's consistent with uh, the history of population genetics, starting from the founders of neo-Darwinian theory. All the population geneticists who have carefully examined it have been troubled. How can we stop mutation accumulation? So what are the implications? There are humanitarian implications. There are evolutionary implications. There are philosophical implications. In terms of um, human welfare, are we seeing degeneration now? Alzheimer's and dementia we now consider normal, but you know, as you just read from the past, it wasn't normal for, for people as they got old to lose their minds. It was normal for the old to be wise and a source of uh, wise counsel. So I believe there is a pandemic for those diseases. Um, autism, it's clear the rates are going up. It's clear there's a genetic component to autism. I believe certain cancers are increasing. I believe autoimmune disorders are increasing and that allergy problems, other uh, immunological problems are increasing. Lynch was saying, maybe this is genetic degeneration. Personally, I don't think that mutation rate is increasing. So I can't imagine that all that would happen in one generation unless it's epigenetic mutation. The whole issue of, there's a whole another layer of information. There's entropic degeneration at all levels. And so even as there's entropic degeneration of the genome, there's also entropic degeneration of the epigenome. And so what about epigenetic mutations? Should we be trying to reduce the rate of epigenetic mutation? Is it an uh, open question? It's not my field, but I, I really think we should strive toward reducing mutation rates. Uh, Lynch suggests in his papers that we just need more death. So if we had lots of juvenile death, that would mean more selection. That's not true. Most juvenile death is due to just bad circumstances. And so he suggests, well, let's go to the third world where there's a high mortality rate and those people will be uh, filtering out the bad mutations. That's not correct. We can increase selection intensity with our numerical simulations. It doesn't stop the problem. Uh, we can uh, go to eugenics, not. Eugenics won't solve it. There's many reasons why. Gene editing, well, you could fix one or two mutations that way in a, in a few people, but it's not a solution for the human population. It doesn't, can't be applied to millions of mutations. And same thing with zygotic selection. So uh, Dr. Kondershoff talked about uh, these two things as kind of a hopeful way to go. I don't think so because you can't, you, it would be only for rich people. So basically reducing mutation rate would help. And we should, I believe, do everything we can to reduce the genetic mutation rate and to reduce the epigenetic mutation rate. My host is the science and philosophy group. And it's all been science, and now I just feel I have license to share my personal perspective on this, even as Lynch and Kondrashev have expressed their point of view. My personal view is a Christian view, and um, we are dying people in a dying world. We all know we're dying people, and we're dying by genetic ent entropy. It's, it's accumulation of mutations, which is why everybody in this room is a more mutant you were are today than you were yesterday. Um, our hope is not in this body. Our hope is not Mother Earth. Our hope is in heaven. That, that's a, a traditional biblical perspective. Um, I think it f matches the data disturbingly well. I do not take genetic entropy lightly. 
because I know that it causes so much suffering and so much death, but I see it as a reality. And so that's why I've been pursuing this research. So thank you so much for listening. I'm happy to, oh, one other thing is, I said I was gonna talk about our virus work. Um, and so during question and answer, if people wanna stay, I'm happy to discuss that. There was a typographical error in the announcement. It says that 100% of the influenza virus mutated, that's a typographical error, but 10% of the H1N1 human version of the uh, influenza virus mutated uh, during a 90 year period. And yes, H1N1 human version did go extinct in 2009. What's circulating now is primarily swine flu versions of H1N1. So I'll, I'll, I'll end it at that. Thank you so much. Yes. Hello, Dr. Stanford. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank you for having your talk. I'm involved in a fairly significant group and your work comes up quite often. Uh, my question is a bit of a two-parter. First, uh, you stated that there was 700 billion new mutations per generation, correct? Uh, at a genome size of 3 billion, wouldn't we, for simplicity's sake, sticking with point mutations, have flipped every single mutation possible multiple times over? Yes. Yes, okay. basically every possible mutation that could happen in the genome has happened during our lifetime. Great. And then you stated that most mutations are in the non-selecting range. Uh, wouldn't at some point you reach an equilibrium where the deleterious mutations flip and become return to the previous state? So um, flipping, flipping of um, back mutations are really rare. So you'd have you'd, your weight. Basically, the, the new mutations are flooding in. Back mutations are exceedingly rare events. And so it'd be just as if there was no back. There is back mutation but it wouldn't stem the tide. Thank you. I wonder whether I, I got that right. Uh, you're arguing that uh, the baby differs from both parents by 100 um, nucleotides. Yeah, or, 50 from each parent. What is actually the experimental evidence for that? We do next generation sequencing and everything, so one could test that today. Is there evidence for that? Yes, so, so I think most of the data is coming from uh, parent-child trios, and um, so they're actually doing sequencing of, of parent and child, and so they actually can count the mutations. There are parts of the genome where they're not countable, like in tandem repeats and things, so they make some adjustment for that. But the 100 mutations per person per generation now is widely being circulated as the actual mutation rate. What fraction is uh, neutral is debatable. Yes. So have you ever considered a situation with some invertebrate species like horseshoe crabs that have been around for um, uh, you know, a long time into the geological record? How does a species like that con uh, continue to exist? It's really a great question. Uh, Kondrashoff actually talks about that. He said um, these, these uh, lineages have a, should have a lifespan limit. And so one, one author I didn't include was um, uh, Dr. Fred Hoyle, a famous physicist. He actually was so interested in this that he spent a few years of his life looking at the mathematics of evolution. And he concluded DNA is degrading, and he said any given piece of DNA has a limited shelf life, basically. And so he envisioned aliens coming and reseeding the planet periodically to make up for all the degenerated genome. So, um, so really, it's hard to uh, imagine deep time lineages surviving unchanged like the horseshoe crab. It's really a conceptual um, hurdle. And, and it's, I think, should be acknowledged widely that how, if, 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 if current, oh, so, one really interesting thing, jumping to the virus issue, is uh, you know we watched the H1N1 virus go from a uh, red-hot pandemic to uh, to a, a whimper to an extinction event in 90 years. Uh, there's a paper recently published that say that all RNA viruses of all different families appear to be evolutionarily young, meaning tens of thousands of years old. Um, 
whereas you'd think that viruses would date back to millions or billions of years ago. And it, it, um, so it's really interesting. Uh, the time element is I, something I don't want to deal with. I just want to deal with the present. I'm wondering what your starting point is, because you're talking about genetic degeneration in humans. What, what is the point where you're starting from? Like, what's the point where, I'm just curious, because you have a continuity of humans coming from some ancestor that we wouldn't consider human. What is the point that you're starting from, from which So, so the starting see, point, that's a good happen. question. Um, basically, if we start with a population with zero mutations, there is a burn-in time where it has to reach equilibrium, where the, um, it takes time for enough genetic diversity to build up in a zero population, um, popula a zero mutation population. Um, and so there is a, a time where it's unrealistic, the degeneration rate is unrealistically high. Um, and so we, we acknowledge that. But we could start anywhere. So we could start, let's suppose that all of the human beings in the world disappeared except the people in this room. We could start and say, OK, the average fitness in this room is one. And then we're going to monitor uh, fitness, not as reproduction, because that's a circular argument. We monitor fitness by function, you know, like IQ or physical strength or things like, or longevity. Those things are um, a better way to measure it. But it's a great question, and it, it is a part of the formulation. We do start with mutations with zero. Uh, we start our populations with zero, and so that's a factor. But we can restart a population once uh, uh, you've reached uh, an equilibrium, a burn-in point, and we still see decline. Thank you for a fascinating talk. Uh, I was just wondering, um, the mutational load is, as you say, is very high, but there's a lot of redundancy in the function of the human genome, and I'm just wondering if anybody has looked at it from that perspective, that there are similar functions, so maybe a, a particular mutation may take out uh, a key, one key gene, but there are uh, redundant systems that can actually take over that function. Yes, so that, that gets in a little bit into the philosophy element, because um, it looks to me, and a lot of people, like the genome is designed to be stabilized by things like diploidy or things like gene family backups or other types of redundancy. So redundancy does, in, in, in modern design, engineering design, we look at redundancy as a really good thing uh, and it is a good thing for our genome. And it's interesting because how do you evolve um, processes that only have long-term effects. Normally, selection can only act upon things are short. Uh, beneficial mutations have a, normally a short-term vision of where they're going, so to speak. Yeah. It's also kind of a two-part question. Uh, the first thing is about formulations from Fisher, right, and the early on population geneticists. So those are um, incredibly useful and formal, but they're also extremely simplistic. Uh, they assume uh, as you're assuming still, like 100 years later, that fitness is just one dimensional feature and that the function of, of, uh, of selection is to increase fitness when it's, it's probably this multidimensional um, mm -hmm. um, feature and that the, the function would be of selection would be to maintain the ability to adapt mm -hmm. and not uh, increase fitness. That's, not, that's just the construct that was used mathematically to formalize this. Right. And, this will lead to the second part, which is uh, the equation should be, um, as was mentioned, for other species, um, correct? So for bacteria, for instance, and this has been studied, so this could be looked at. It. If, if your predictions are right, this should be observed in bacterial populations. They should collapse after um, a little bit of, like, uh, uh, measurable amount of time in the lab because they go through a lot of generations and you can measure more accurately the distribution of mutations and uh, uh, the number of generations and even sequence everything. Um, and, and see the predictions, but that doesn't seem to happen. Okay, those are all really good points. Let's see if I can remember what they were. Uh, the first one was, um, oftentimes it's not about gain in fitness, but adaptation. Right. I totally agree. Adaptive mutations are, are real. We can document them. They, they have value, but they don't necessarily increase net, net um, 
information. So I look at adaptation mutations mostly as fine-tuning systems. Um, and so, in a sense, adaptations let a species remain the species because the species can accommodate changing environments. Um, the second issue you brought up was multidimensional. Um, I totally agree that the typical population genetics formulas are crazily oversimplified. The reason we went to numerical simulation is we, 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 do, we call our numerical simulations uh, comprehensive because we try to consider all the variables and uh, rather than just like a lot of uh, in the past numerical simulations only simulate some part of evolutionary process or like let's say the rate of drift or the rate of uh, some and they often have simplifying assumptions like truncation selection or no environmental variance things like that so to do good numerical simulations you have to consider like 30 parameters and they're all adjustable but you can, you, so you can look at a wide range of possibilities, but you realize that you can't reduce this to a, a formula. And so I agree with that. Your last point was? Yeah, exactly that point. If you can't reduce it to a formula, you can't model realistic systems. And then when you look at systems like bacteria, mm. um, oh, where this bacteria. is not happening, for instance, okay. so I was talking about bacteria. Yeah. Which right. Okay, so the bacteria point. is also a good question. So I recently read a paper about reductive evolution in bacteria, and the long-term E. coli experiment also reflects this, is bacteria rapidly adapt to a new medium or a new environment. And that's really interesting. It's, a, it's an adaptation. They're not gaining any new function. All those experiments usually actually involve reductive evolution. For example, all of the beneficial mutations in the long-term Lenske experiment were loss of function. Genes were deleted, genes were silenced, or genes, genes were downregulated. So uh, in one case, a promoter, which is normally regulated, became an unregulated promoter. But all that is adaptive fine tuning. There is no new information being created. And in fact, technically, as the bacteria jettisons unnecessary genes for that environment, they are actually painting themselves into a corner. They won't be able to survive in any other environment. So they become handicapped in a sense. So there's a one, another paper on reductive evolution in bacteria where they say, uh, they, they were looking at a specific bacteria, they said one third of all random deletions increased fitness. It has to do with getting rid of any genes that aren't necessary for the moment. It's very short term, uh, you know, the bacteria, it works for them short term, but if they, then when they need those genes that they've jettisoned, uh, they can't, they don't have them. So it's a, it's a down, that's even that, in my opinion, that type of adaptation is um, entropic. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you for such a provocative uh, talk where you give us the thesis that uh, according to current biological paradigms, we don't exist. Um, but my question is, is um, so much of that thesis hinges on um, a, a, sim a simple piece of evidence that we don't have a normal distribution of deleterious and beneficial mutations. Um, and my, my question really is, how can we empirically test this when we can only look to the past and present and we actually don't know the future of mutations? A number of geneticists have tried to quantitate the actual distribution of mutations. It's actually hard to quantify the near neutrals because they're so neutral that you can't see the effect. And so there is a certain amount of uh, assumption there. Um, the, let's see, lost my train of thought. Your question was, how can we know the distribution of mutations? Sure. And so Lenski's experiment is really interesting because um, they, because they were periodically sequencing the population as it changed, they could actually determine exactly, and, and they could determine when mutations arose, they could see which mutations were beneficial. Only a tiny fraction were beneficial, and they were all reductive. Mm -hmm. So there's, that's a quantitative thing. Uh, also, we, we did a, a research on the influenza virus, so Rob Carter and I, um, turns out that over the last uh, 70 years or so, uh, medical people have been freezing influenza samples. 
And then all those samples for, through history have, were sequenced. So we have this historical sequence, kind of like the Lenski situation, but with influenza. And what we see is that, um, well, actually, let me just show a slide here. This is our numerical simulation. Mutation goes up perfectly linearly, and fitness goes down uh, in a, with a fitness decline curve. And this is the influenza study that we did. Uh, Rob gathered uh, sequence data going back to the 30s. And what he sees is a strict linear accumulation, just in the same way. So basically, it's clock-like. 10% of the H1N1 influenza virus mutated. And um, so this is, this is genetic entropy at work. And it's, it's supported by other people who have been following H1N1's virulence. And they show that the decline over since, since again, records were being kept, or actually since the 1918 influenza, uh, is that the virulence declined in the same type of way that, um, that we see in our simulations to the point where in 2009, that human version of H1N1, there's still H1N1 circulating that's swine flu, but H1N1 went extinct in 2009. So that's clearly indicating that this is not neutral or adaptive. This is genetic entropy at work in a biological system where we can measure what's going on. There were mutations, by the way, there was some adaptation. There were some beneficial mutations happening, but it wasn't enough to stop extinction. And these two other curves were two other influenza outbreaks, and they similarly underwent entropic decay. Uh, I don't, they didn't go extinct yet, but they're clearly headed that way. So we do have some biological data. Okay. It's, it's, well, thank you. It's true that it's largely theoretical, but there's now growing biological data. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I really appreciate you showing up, and I know I've taken too much time. Um, I have a few books that I'm happy to share with you, uh, one genetic entropy and one on contested bones. Um, if, if you think you're going to read it, you're welcome to a copy. Um, the BINP, Biological Information, New Perspectives, that proceedings is in the NIH library. And um, you can, but you don't want to read that proceedings. It would take you a few months. It's uh, 25 really long papers, very technical, on all the different dimensions to biological information. But there's a, like a synopsis you can read in a few hours which is freely available at BINP.org. It stands for Biological Information New Perspectives.org. Uh, and there you can download the synopsis for free. So if that interests you, that's available. But uh, thank you so much for your patience. <laughs>